Hello and welcome to another episode of Questioning Behaviour. I am one of your hosts, Sarah Bowen, and I'm here with my co-host... Merle van der Dakke. Always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy that don't believe And on today's episode, we're actually going to be talking to someone who is a behavioral science communicator, someone who is interested in applying behavioral insights not only to their own life, but to the lives of others. Mm -hmm. But before we talk to them, I want to talk to my co-host. How are you? I'm what's, fine. What's Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for asking. I'm really excited about this episode because, I mean, you've already called him a behavioral science communicator. Not his mm. official job title, but if he ever wanted a different <laughs> job title, this one would work quite nicely because I think when it comes to someone being, uh, because he is an industry as a practitioner, I feel in mm -hmm. general he is one of the most vocal, or at least he has a lot of like communication type projects in which, in on top of his actual job. So I find that uh, mm. I find that quite impressive. I'm very excited to have him on. Oh yeah, very admirable. Yeah, and this is this is something that I think will continue to to fascinate me until we all decide to come to a consensus on the matter. But it's the 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 sort of the problem or the question of professional identity in this industry. Mm -hmm. Like, what? Who are we as a collective? Like, are we behavioral scientists? You know, is that that's sort of what we decided on for now? But I I'm always interested to hear the different ways you know individuals brand themselves, right? Because mm -hmm. I guess that's part of the game a little bit. You have to try and find yourself a little niche in this this market, which which is it oversaturated behavioral science? Uh, is that a question for me or for him? Because I have started a <laughs> blog. I am now on a podcast. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like if if I say, "Oh no, it's oversaturated," please stay away. I feel like maybe there's some you know self interest going on there. Yeah, I think if there is a problem, we're definitely a part of it in mm -hmm. in some way. Well, you know, depends on your perspective, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let, let's talk to someone who has added to the behavioral science newsletters, who has definitely written uh, some blog posts. I know this because I've collaborated on a blog post with him. Mm. Very nice, <laughs> very nice. Who has recently, and this will come up later in the episode as well, is also starting their own bloody podcast, because why the fuck not? Now... It's probably not very surprising who we're about to introduce, but we are going to be talking to Samuel Salzer, which I'm not pronouncing correctly, but let's just dive into it and take it away, Sam. So today we're actually talking to Samuel Salzer, which I've already butchered that name completely because the name is Scandinavian, which Everyone knows no one in the world except Scandi can pronounce that name. So without me continuing to ruin uh, the person that we're talking to today, Sam, how about you just introduce yourself and help me out of this pickle? Sure. Well, I'm happy to be here. My name is Samuel Salser. I am a behavioral strategist based out of Stockholm, Sweden. And I'm very passionate about how to put what we know from behavioral science and the research we have built up over the years to practice, and especially in digital interventions, but in quite a lot of different settings. So really interested in how we can take what we have learned in this discipline that's still evolving, but really see what works in practice in the real world. So that's my passion. All right, sounds good. So that's great. behavioral strategist is a term I don't think we've heard before with any of our other interviewees. So what does a behavioral strategist do? <laughs> Great question. I had a fun conversation about this actually yesterday where we were kind of joking in terms of beha behavioral in itself in a title becoming a little bit hype at the moment. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are putting behavioral in the title who were maybe before used to oh, yeah. marketers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it's, strategies has been something that I think for a long time, anyone who's a little bit of a douche would put it in the title to look a little more like <laughs> Are smarter. you a douche, Sam? Is that what you're I try saying? Not to be. I try not to be, but I'm being honest here as well. <laughs> so... Uh, it started with actually when we're starting to build the field here in Sweden, I came back having worked quite a bit abroad. And about four years ago, I came back to Sweden, joined Behavior Lab, who was the first Swedish consultant at the time. And they were just kind of getting going, like very early going. 
And uh, we were like, what the heck should we call ourselves? And what we decided was behavioral strategist because mm -hmm. we were kind of balancing between different names. And we felt that that was most accurately describing what we were doing with our clients. So a lot of the things we were doing with the clients was uh, doing a more of a, um, call it like a wider view of, of the work, not like doing some specific things like research per se, or maybe just designing interventions, but a lot of it was helping them with strategic, strategic questions using behavioral, right. the behavioral science perspective. And so <laughs> it became the kind of natural thing to, to say. And we actually had to register that with the, the tax authorities because we didn't know what to put into the tax returns. And so, and there, there was no one with that title before in Sweden. So, so yeah, we had to do that. And so that's kind of tells, tells you a little about the field in the, in the world, but especially mm -hmm. in Sweden as well. So uh, we can safely call you a, a pioneer in behavioral strategy, mm -hmm. I guess. Is, is there a reason why you didn't go for behavioral scientist? Is it just too associated to sort of the academic side of things? Like why distinguish yourself from, you know, the title of behavioral scientist? Great question. So for me, it was that I would feel like a fraud if I said I was a behavioral scientist because I have, I have been, you know, Hardcore. at university, I've been doing some things, but uh, I don't really feel like I can fully live up to that title given some other people I think has really done the work of doing, let's say, a PhD or something like that. And oh, don't worry, Sam. We'll happily take you on. No shame. Welcome to the yes. game, man. <laughs> well, if you say yeah, that, if you say that, I'm, I'm happy to, to take it on. No, but I, I feel like it's, yeah, I didn't really feel, especially at the time, and I still not really now that I can really carry that mantle. And the only one that I was kind of initially, conf I think I had it on my LinkedIn for a while, was behavioral designer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. It's it's a little bit similar in, in that, yeah, it's a little bit unusual maybe. But I don't know. I felt easier and more straightforward to say behavioral strategist and more encompassing maybe. But yeah, I've gone yeah. by behavioral designer before as well. Okay. And uh, talking, you know, as as uh, a man of many hats, you do own many hats in terms of the sort of the work that you do. So your presence online. So I know that you write blogs, you've got your own website, looks as though you have sort of your own consultancy, you're an author, you do lots of stuff within the sort of the behavioral science communication, you know, outside of the just the your day job, so to speak. I mean, would you describe that as being like part of your day job as sort of side hobbies? Uh, and and have I named them all? I feel like a hobby by this stage doesn't even remotely cover the load anymore. Right, right. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. If I've missed one of your Many. one of your prestigious hats, Many. hats, let me know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's been a little bit of an interesting journey for me as well. I would say so. I think initially it was very much like I do. I'm an independent consultant, and I work as a behavioral strategist. That was kind of my title. But then with the field, it's very hard to lead the field if you don't do also some form of public speaking or workshops, that kind of stuff, because the field is so new. No one really knows what the heck we're doing. We have to kind of tell people, this is what we're doing. This is how it can be used for you. And I think that's a very good way to do that. It might not be very effective actually training people. I think being honest, any type of public speaking or you know workshops has probably very low, I don't know what you call it, like ROI in terms of what actually people <laughs> apply afterwards. I've been very hard on myself there and mm -hmm. tried to do my best, but it's still hard. Like, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard thing, but it, at least it gives people awareness. I think that's what they can do. And so that's realistically a way to get people at least aware of the field. And then I guess what you guys mentioned is that I've been very passionate about that in terms of spreading more insights mm -hmm. to how people can get going in the field, how I can make it easier for other people to get started than it was for me. Because I think for me, it was like I came into mm -hmm. this fucking jungle of sort where I was kind of <laughs> coming with a machete and I had to like fight my way through the jungle and I saw other friends who were like accountants whatever who had this paved way way where like they used to like drive straight ahead and they had no real qualms of like what to do or where to go mm -hmm. and uh, I think for me a lot of the work that I've kind of like you said I started as a hobby and maybe passion projects has mm -hmm. developed a little bit more just because I find it so valuable and, and meaningful to do. So I have my newsletter, I mm -hmm. have, like you mentioned, my website, I have some other stuff. And and I think it's mostly just that idea, like creating in the world what I wish existed when I started. 
and it's quite gratifying to, yeah. to do that stuff cool that's good work yeah no i uh i am a fan of your work i know sarah's as well it's good that you've already mentioned the newsletter because we did really want to talk about that so i feel like one of the things you might be most famous for or most known if you will is habit weekly so how did habit weekly start was it one of the many many passion projects right so yeah it was maybe one of many initially and it was very funny how it started so it literally was just a random thing i was sitting on a friday and I was like, hmm, I spent a lot of time this week looking for good content to kind of read through in terms of good behavioral science content. Mm -hmm. And I spent another couple of hours trying mm -hmm. to see if that was there because I was like, there, surely there must be a way. There must be someone who's compiling mm -hmm. this stuff. And the only one who were doing it was kind of like these organizations who were doing it mostly like as a way to market themselves. So they were, mm -hmm. you know, having like, here's us, here's all the cool things we're doing. And here's some cool things you can learn about. <laughs> yeah. in the world as well. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well, maybe no one is doing this. So let's see if I put out the LinkedIn post compiling what I've found this week, maybe that would be valuable for some people. And mm -hmm. so that's how, what I did. Um, I think I titled it like behavioral insights of the week or best behavioral insights of the week even. And um, nice. <laughs> got like 15 likes, not, not a big reception. But I was like, okay, this was kind of nice. Like at least some people liked it. Maybe in the next week I started to do it again. And I literally was like, I should call this something. And a lot of my work has been around habits. So how to create habit forming products and services, mm. that kind of stuff. And it's like, probably I should have it in name. And then I was like, well, it seems like I might be doing this on a weekly basis if this is going to pick up. So like weekly habits was taken as a domain. Aww. Habit Weekly was not taken. <laughs> so I was like, well, that, do, that, that can make do. And um, mm -hmm. so I called it Habit Weekly. And then that's how it started. So I, I think I put it out for four weeks in a row on LinkedIn. By week four, um, mm -hmm. actually, Nikola, a good friend, uh, now I didn't know him that not much at the time, but he said like, hey, I don't like to have this in my LinkedIn feed. I want it in my newsletter, like as a newsletter in my inbox instead. Can you create a mailing list? And then I was like, well, if people want it, I'll, I'll do it. And so that's <laughs> if how it there's started. a gap in the market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So about two years ago, a little nice. less, I had this like, you know, very scary moment of having to send away the first newsletter to 25 people. And I was like, oh my God, this is nerve wracking. <laughs> but, um, mm. but yeah. And then I think slowly but surely I've kind of just felt that both the reception has been very well received, like it's been very well received. And so I think that had egged me on a little bit. But in general, it's been quite fun to just see how I can do this thing as good as I possibly can. And recently, yeah. actually, I, this week was the 100th anniversary, or like in terms of 100 newsletters. Oh, congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Yay. It's a little round of applause. Exciting, yeah. A little audio round of applause. And yeah, I, yeah, I kind of looked back uh, and, and looked at, okay, what's been the kind of transition? Like, how did my first newsletter look like? The 20th newsletter and 50th, whatever. And yeah, there's been a lot of incremental improvements. Like that's been the, the motto so far. Like mm -hmm. perfection is the enemy of good and just like doing things a little bit better every time. That's been the idea. Awesome. I, I, I find it so interesting because, you know, obviously when you were starting out, you know, you realized that there was a gap in the market. You weren't, you were a consumer originally, right? And then there wasn't the product you were looking for. So you went out and created it for other people. But I don't know whether it's just because I've been in the behavioral science bubble for a long time, but I often feel as though the market's quite saturated mm -hmm. now in terms of behavioral science communications. I mean, Which is exactly look at us, we're doing we a podcast. podcast. <laughs> the yeah. I mean, this is, this is not a new concept. There's so many people now doing podcasts and, and there's newsletters. And I mean, it may be, as you say, that most of these are being sort of produced by organizations so obviously pushing their own interests a little bit but i'm interested like do you also share that opinion that it's a bit saturated and and if so like what's next like how would you choose to like push the frontier of communication are you going to set up a podcast too <laughs> just you know <laughs> we could be guests as we're plugging ourselves but wow um, sarah has a plan <laughs> <laughs> I hate to admit this, but there will be a podcast coming out. And, no! Um, God damn it! I know, I know. It's, it's, uh, out. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. It's pretty terrible. Uh, the world definitely didn't need another podcast, but I have a good reason for it, I think. So 
Don't before I talk about that, I know, I know, don't we all. Uh, <laughs> motivated reasoning, of course. But um, before I go to that, I was going to ask you a question. So what's been interesting, obviously, with my mm -hmm. newsletter is that every week I've pretty much tried to look for every content that exists within the behavioral science world, especially applied behavioral science. And so since the start, especially two years ago, I spent every week looking and seeing, like, hey, what are the podcasts out there? What is the articles that I can find? What is the videos on YouTube? Like everything in behavioral science, like where can I find it? And I can definitely see that there's been, you know, when I started, there was some stuff out there, but especially when it comes to podcasts, like when I started, let's say behavioral groups wasn't out there. Like behavioral groups started around mm. the same time, a little bit after. Mm -hmm. um, and there were like a lot of these podcasts that are like really established now somewhat wasn't there. And so it's been a lot of stuff happening in the last just two years. And so um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens in another two years. I predict that there will be um, people like you guys and me that's still going to think that there's going to be a need for another podcast. And uh, <laughs> there's not enough hours in the day uh, I to know, do I know. more, really. But, but I think it's honest. interesting, though, with the field is that where we're probably heading in mo many ways is that we have had this very wide netcast on behavioral science, applied behavioral science. I can see a lot of podcasts being like very niche. I think you see the likes of, uh, like you might know, is it's Ghana Pogrub? Uh, yeah, Ghana. Yeah, was last yeah. Name Ghana, idol, absolute idol. I love right. her. <laughs> yeah, our hero. Yeah, so, you know, she's been doing some cool stuff with like behavioral science and data science. Mm -hmm. And also now with like behavioral science and Formula One. You know, so like yes. mm -hmm. there can be a lot of those things, I think, that can that can kind of grow out of the field. So it I doesn't think that's... matter what Ghana does. I will listen to it. I will consume it. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's fantastic. Yeah, I 100% agree. <laughs> she's fantastic. And um, yeah, we actually collaborated a little bit and she talked a little bit about just that growing field of behavioral data science, which is... Oh, fun. yeah. I'm, I'm glad that this that's coming up. Well, it's not even coming up. It's, it's pretty established as is, but mm -hmm. I'm excited to see what comes out of that field for sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to definitely happen. Some emergence there. And then... Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to just also seeing the things that are popping up now, just getting a little more, I don't know, um, wind beneath their sails, doing a little more cool stuff. You have the yeah. likes of, mm -hmm. you know, call like the first maybe type of podcast that were out there, maybe like Choiceology and Freakonomics were quite well produced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they were like coming from, from Charles Schwab and Freakonomics was like quite established brand and yeah. not really mm -hmm. in the line of like, true maybe in the vein of behavioral science it's like sometimes talks about it but not really and mm -hmm. um so i'd love to see some of like the likes of you guys are doing like getting some more on your sale <laughs> uh, becoming becoming that really um you know well-known thing so yeah i think it's going to be exciting time set. Mm. i have a question then because you said it before that you know you felt like as uh, compared to your friends who moved into accountancy or like slightly more established fields and you were there you know with a machete uh cutting through the jungle that those are your words not mine but do you feel that the generation of behavioral scientists coming up now when i say coming up i mean coming out of phds or now having come out of degrees and going into um you know the practitioner side of things do you think we have it easier <laughs> yes easier yes easy i don't know but easier yes so i think now there's a little more clear path in terms of okay either you i don't know if i'm going to paint the brush or structure brush a little bit too wide here but either you're probably going to look for getting a job at some of the like behavioral consultancies out there either you're going to try to find a job at one of the like the teams that are building in like organizations around behavioral science or you're going to like find this weird role somewhere in some organizations where they're like hey we need some person with some UX background and some behavioral science background, whatever they, they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Some like these weirder roles that are a little bit weird. And then obviously uh, academia, academia as well. Uh, so you have those paths that are like definitely much, much there, more there than when I started. So when I started, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah, it was very hard for either of those to find, uh, honestly. I was first starting in Australia. In Australia now, it's like super, you know, you have at least three or four well-established places where you can definitely mm -hmm. find work where they have at least probably, I don't know, 20, 25 people at least. <laughs> it's not a big field still. It's mm -hmm. quite small, but, you know, much more than it was like nothing at the time. So, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I think it's easier. But um, Fair enough. a little bit of plug-in here, but 
you know, we did some valuable research here, I think, in terms of that's been very well received. So uh, mm-hmm. me and, and Merle were uh, collaborating on this behavioral guide for graduates. And yes. um, that's been very well received. And, and that's, yep. I think, one way to get a little bit of sense of like how to start as well. Making it even easier. I have to confess, I haven't read it. And oh, I'm dear. about to become a behavioral science. Shame. 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 Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, ostriching, putting my head in the sand, like not thinking about it <laughs> um, the next day. I mean, who isn't by this stage? Let's, let's not pretend the job market is currently looking pretty. But then... Mm-hmm. Because, because you know, Sam, you are one of many, and I don't mean to say that you're old. I'm just saying you're a bit more of an OG <laughs> than Sarah and I. It is the truth. You know what I mean? No, but it's like Sam doesn't have like, you know, Sarah and I will come out of this with like behavioral science degrees. Whereas um, a lot of the OGs, including you, I'm not calling you old, don't have necessarily that background, but moved into the field and made that field your own with the background that you had. So now that there is a more clear cut path, if you will, into behavioral science, do you think that might actually be detrimental to the field or just make it more boring or more niche? So um, thanks for calling me a gangster. Uh, second, you're welcome. Secondly, oh, gee, Sam. <laughs> I'll take the positive side of that. What are you saying? So, mm-hmm. yeah, I would. So, the, <laughs> to your question, though, I do think there's a risk of, you know, when you're, I guess, now I'm speaking by my experience, right? So, mm-hmm. when forced to really think outside of the box, you do things quite differently than you do if you go along, let's say, that accountant approach where you just follow the path that's laid out in front of you, you use the models, the frameworks, whatever that's taught to you, and you accept that for the best version out there or like the best way to do things. Uh, For me, it wasn't really, you know, how I went about things. I was very much like, okay, uh, nothing really seems like it's really well thought out in the way where I feel like it's, you know, something great that I can just follow. I have to like you know, learn from this one, like what, what are they doing in California with like at Sanford? Like what are they doing in the UK? What, like what, what's, what's happening? And like, how, how can I compare and learn from these things? And um, so I think for me, it became like I had to really compare and contrast, see what's good, see what's bad and see how I can maybe find a way that's the best for me, given what I want to do. And so I guess that forced me to think a little bit outside of the box, forced me to, maybe be more critical in terms of the things that I started using and how I use them and so on, not just accepting them for, you know, this great things for what they are. So I think that it's very valuable to still do that, even if you have gone through some of these wonderful programs that are out there, including what you guys are, you know, going through. Uh, it's really useful to not think that you have that perfect formula for applied behavioral science success, whatever you say, and yeah. be very humble to the idea that, we're still so early in the field. We're still in probably one of the more messy, complex fields out there. Mm-hmm. When it comes to models, frameworks, process of applying these things in practice, the the proof is, or like what do you call it, like the, the perfect formula is not there yet. It's very far from there. Right. And so I think the big risk is if people go out in the field thinking that like, okay, now I've done my degree at whatever UCL and thinking that, now I know what it is to know what to be a behavioral scientist. And, and I think when it comes to our discipline, it's just such a crucial thing to always be humble, always remind yourself of how little you know. I think that's something I'm, you know, it's not that hard in some ways. I feel like you get slapped that in the face quite easily if you're, <laughs> if you're doing something in the real world when you think like, okay, I, I, think, I think I know this now, having done like four or five different, you know, either experiments or projects, and then you do a fifth or sixth experiment and you realize, wait, this didn't go exactly uh, at all like I planned. Like, what the heck happened? And then realizing mm-hmm. that, okay, there's still much more to learn and, and so on. So, No, I, I, yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. I don't think it's something that I've thought about in that way uh, before, but I, I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, as universities are trying to create programs that are sort of training people for this new job market, right? This new type of career that you can have, whether it's behavioral strategist or a behavioral designer or, you know, a behavioral scientist. It's really interesting. I think even since I started the PhD, 
being in, inside like my insular academic bubble, I think the, the focus really is on learning about my discipline and learning tools that are going to serve me well outside of you know, the classroom, whether that's staying in academia or whether it's, it's, you know, taking the plunge and, and leaving the nest. Right. But I, I think so. I mean, I, I've just finished like a, a three month internship with, uh, in the civil service, like sort of working with behavioral scientists who are, you know, applying behavioral insights and working in a professional environment. And I learned so much about my discipline in three months, more than I probably learned in the past three years of the PhD. Oops. <laughs> because I, I think, it, which is crazy, but I think one of the strengths of this discipline is that even though, you know, we're talking about maybe like a behavioral science degree, there's still so much influence across so many disciplines. You know, someone who trains as a psychologist could finish their degree and enter a career in behavioral science and be perfectly calibrated, sort of understand the concepts and start applying behavioral science. The same thing as someone who's come up through sort of an economics pathway or a sociology pathway, there's this, or even just like a pure, like sort of designing pathway. I think that that's one of the strengths of the field is that it caters to and can be understood through so many different lenses that, I mean, hopefully that means that we won't have this sort of homogenized sort of standardized version of what behavioral science is, you know, that, that people are, are being taught. But I don't know. I think uh, it's definitely an interesting question to think about, for sure. Yeah. Have you guys heard of uh, Robert Sapolsky? Yes. No. Who's that? Sort of. Well, oh. sort <laughs> See, of, I okay. don't know anything. <laughs> well, he's an interesting guy. I think he, uh, let me remember if his title is neuroendocrinologist. I think he's a professor at Stanford Ooh. in neuroendocrinology, which is a weird thing to say in itself as a thing. But um, you did it very yeah, well. thank you. Um, so what he, I think, brings as an interesting perspective, he has a book called Behave. And a lot of his work is just trying to look at what makes behavior happen from different perspectives. And in his book, he talks a lot about this idea of you know, the risk of falling into buckets, which pretty much like like you describe as like looking at only from one lens, maybe, or maybe mm -hmm. being in a in a certain silo and having a struggle with getting out of that and noticing that, okay, depending on who you are, like looking at the field now, maybe we can put people a little bit in terms of like, the, okay, let's say you're a psychologist. Uh, you're probably going to look at what makes behavior happen differently than a behavioral economist uh, versus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, gamification consultant, whatever. There's a lot of people doing behavior mm -hmm. change work. And it's very yeah. interesting to then see that, okay, if each of these people are then tasked to understand or describe a behavior, they're going to describe it very differently. And he, in the book, he looks more like also from, like, for example, endocrinology, like in terms of like hormones and that kind of stuff, like what happened in, in the body before in terms of hormonal changes that make this behavior happen and goes mm -hmm. all the way back from, like the millisecond before the behavior happened, uh, which looking at the kind of neuroscience of what made the behavior happen to the millions of years before the behavior happened in terms of the evolutionary psychology and biology that explained the behavior. And I think very it's really nice. useful. Yeah, it's a very useful exercise just to think about, okay, there's so many ways we can look at this behavior happening. And it's very easy to fall into this idea of thinking that, well, I have the explanation now. I'm coming out of my degree in psychology Behavior, like whatever it is, uh, and thinking that I have the explanation of, I know now how to describe behavior, but actually, you know, maybe like anyone who, who has done something, like, you know, part of it. And I, I think it's, it's both daunting a little bit, but it's exciting because I feel like that's what's fun with this work. It's like you can continually add lenses to your work and you can continually like see things more in a more, you know, nuanced way or more colorful way. So, um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a it's a good way of looking at it. It's almost like I don't know if you heard the idea of the ele what do you call it? like the, the blind man, blind man and the elephant. No, Sorry, what's this? Tell, tell us more. <laughs> it's about like a metaphor. The blind man. It's and a the metaphor elephant. where you have some blind men coming up to the elephant. They're trying to figure out what it is. One person is holding the trunk. It's like oh, I think it's a snake. And mm -hmm. one thing, one person is like uh. bang on the side of it. And it's like no, I think it's a wall. And obviously they are touching it in different places. So they, 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 you know, describe different things. And um, sure. I think that's the same thing for people in our field. Ask a behavioral economist, you know, traditional behavioral scientist, even like someone like who studied behavioral science at Stanford, let's say, who's 
gonna go through like VG Fog stuff versus someone who's done it at let's say UCL, uh, they will look at the same problem and describe it very differently, or the same behavior and describe it differently. And I think that's very useful to mm-hmm. just remind ourselves that that's the case. Well, but at least we don't have to worry about the field turning too homogenous. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think probably the opposite is currently somewhat like the challenge. Like we have so many different people doing different things. There's yeah. a new model coming out every week. So I think mm-hmm. that's the challenge in, in terms of how I see yeah. it right now. That's probably the challenge right now in terms of how can we better find common grounds and better support and collaborate and find a better mutual understanding of, of this field. Is that something you see in the future of behavioral science anytime soon? Well, there's a lot of incentives that goes in the opposite direction. So oh, uh, that's, a shame. that's a problem. <laughs> so if you start a consultancy, a great way to start it is with a framework that's only you know and only you know you can teach. And so you see a lot of that. If you're a- academic, you know it's probably yeah. much easier to earn tenure if you're finding your own model than working on other people's models. So same thing there. So I'm a little bit, you know, skeptical in terms of <laughs> that it's not going to be easy to do that mm. work but uh, there are some good stuff happening in terms of you have two initiatives in terms of um, for the applied side of things to organize so you have gabs who are trying to form like the global association of applied scientists and then you have i'm blanking on the name now but a similar thing happening more like in the u.s mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. you know maybe some of those things can help um to, to, yeah, I yeah. mean, this is this is the question about professional identity, you know. And does does someone who works in a behavioral science consultancy do they feel like they're in this sort of a similar profession as someone who maybe works in the civil service, sort of applying behavioral insights to problems? They're like, I guess, structurally doing the same thing, but you know, having different tailored approaches. You know, obviously, we know behavior is context dependent. That's sort of like the mantra that we that we we say to ourselves you know every time we wake up in the morning but uh yeah it poses an interesting question i like that you do <laughs> i like that you do that's, that's a great thing yeah i, I don't, don't think everyone does but i think everyone should <laughs> so yeah yeah just to remind myself i know it's context dependent mm-hmm. yeah but it, it is it poses an interesting question as to you know where the professional identity is is going i know that there is incentives for people to do i mean i guess you could call it incentives to sort of innovate and create some sort of like usp and sort of ip within behavioral science but yeah i don't know we'll see where it converges to i think economics maybe a little bit has a little bit too much sway in terms of professional identity in the academic world but yeah i'm not sure we'll we'll figure it out but um i know it's interesting to think about what is your favorite um, yeah. model or framework? I'm just curious. So past three months, obviously, I learned a lot about um, different types of models and frameworks. And the the ones that um, we mostly use, so I was working within Public Health England. So the ones that are predominant are the sort of the it's the models that were produced by Susan Mickey. Uh-huh. So Behavior Change Wheel, the TDF, um, the Combi framework. Um really, really uh, key, I guess, in terms of the way that behavioral science was being used in that team. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, there's there's still so many. Like I look at the list of acronyms and I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I probably need to read that one and figure out what that is. But, you know, it's all similar flavors of the same, you know, idea. But I would say one that I came across in the past three months that I wasn't able to use, but really piqued my interest was the use of sort of systems mapping and personas, which I find thought was just super interesting. So it's basically trying to almost as if you were going to create the decision environment within a computer, within sort of a a model and walk different personas through that environment and try to figure out where they're going to encounter barriers or facilitators to a certain decision and sort of developing these personas where you take demographic characteristics that you know you think are going to interact with you know the way that people make decisions and the way the decision environment responds to the individual and create personas at like opposite ends of these uh demographic indicators you know and so it 
it's all about untangling these layers of complexity, which I yeah, just find super, super cool. But, uh, but yeah, what about you? Do you have a favorite that you fall back on in terms of frameworks and models? I think I do. I mm. uh, think I do. It's probably quite underrated, I would say, as a model. Okay. I think, uh, Merle, Merle, you will probably know which one I'm talking oh, about. Oh, I know where we're going. I know. Come on, then. Okay. Tell ABC. the audience. ABC yes. model. So, um, brief, brief intro or like kind of explanation of the ABC model, where it comes from, it's pretty much from a lot of work in clinical psychology. Like it obviously comes from work that's been going on for a long time in behavioral psychology. And it's now a very, very like cornerstone in especially cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's kind of like most cognitive behavioral therapists knows this model. And I came across it because I was leading a project, kind of a big EU project that was tasked to develop this digital application supporting especially people with smoking or drinking related behavior that go into surgery had to stop that for 12 weeks. And so this digital application was supposed to kind of guide them those 12 weeks to stop them smoking and drinking for eight weeks before and four weeks after. And with that work, obviously I did a lot of work together with various types of clinical psychologists and different people in kind of behavior relating to addictions and so on. And um, mm -hmm. I thought it was really, really useful in terms of it looks at behavior in a very somewhat objective way, like really looking at behavior for what it is, what we can see. That cares less about like motivation, which is a very st strange thing to try to define. You have motivation, something that's thrown out a lot when you talk about behavior change, but ask anyone mm -hmm. to define the motivation and they'll be like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if they come up with something, like who knows if that is the actual motivation. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, so really what the ABC model tries to do is that it's really simple in its basic form. It's like a kind of a napkin model where you have something that happens before the behavior, like an antecedent, you have the behavior itself, mm -hmm. and then you have a consequence afterwards. So that's kind of how you analyze things. And then you kind of start peeling the layers back. So you have with antecedents, you have, you know, similar to, as you would talk about like internal, external, maybe triggers or cues, you can talk about that as well with antecedents. You have in consequence, you have direct and delayed consequences. Uh, and then you have other things as well that just gives a little more nuance to, to this thing. And so I think what I've noticed is that's really, really useful as a basis for trying to understand what makes behavior happen. So doing behavioral mapping where you're looking at, okay, what is the antecedents and consequences for doing these behaviors? Like for that project, we did it with obviously smoking and drinking. So actually what mm -hmm. we did there was we had user interviews and we asked them to first like map out on a day every cigarette they had. And then we then mapped out this kind of, I actually don't know how to translate it in English, but it's kind of like the collect touch points or things happening around the behavior. So like, where were they? Who were they interacting with? Those kind of things. And then, then mapping the antecedents. So like, okay, what happened before the cigarette? You know, what happened inside of you and outside of you before the cigarette? Okay. And what happened after the cigarette? Like what happened inside of you and outside of you after the cigarette? And then mapping that for every cigarette and noticing, okay, there's a lot of things happening here. Like some cigarettes are have antecedents relating to craving. Some have relating to other like emotional discomfort. Some have relating to maybe social triggers or stuff like that. And, and some consequences are very like the first cigarette in the morning, people experience a really big peak, like super, you know, because you have the nicotine that hasn't been really uh, released for a couple of at least eight to eight, eight to 10 hours. And so when you get that first nicotine kick, it's like really rewarding. But then, I mean, we you know, don't really know that for sure. No, maybe, I mean, some people sleepwalk, maybe some people even sleep smoke. Addiction right. is a real problem. <laughs> it is a real problem. And so but what's really interesting then was just having that as a very basic thing, but then stacking all this, you know, I think we had almost 50 interviews in total on top of each other, we would eat each of them at least like 10 to 15, you know, data points on cigarettes as a very basic, basic way of like getting some form of mix of qualitative insights. That was really effective for us to better understand, okay, what seems to be some themes here? Like, okay, what seems to be things we really had to address in terms of supporting people to manage some of these antecedents? And then how can we mitigate and like understand these consequences as well? Maybe 
find other ways to achieve similar things. So, so yeah, as a simple model, I think is really, really useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always nice when it has a lot of research backing and is used for treating the hardest things. You know, if mm -hmm. you know a model is used for treating the worst type of like challenges when it comes to behavior change, like addiction, those kind of things, it can probably be useful for less extreme things as well. So yeah, that's my pitch. I'm going to mm -hmm. now collect all of the money from the ABC Foundation. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes. I see you wore your ABC T-shirt today for the podcast reporting. Yeah, don't forget to recording. buy a hat at ABC <laughs> or a mug. Merch, yes. ABCmerch.com. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, collect yeah. of course. Very nice. Now. Very good plug. Collect that money. <laughs> mm. No, it's it's interesting that you're talking about sort of you know work you've done on smoking and alcohol addiction. You know, some people might call these things bad habits, or that might be a little bit of an you know underestimate in terms of, you know, actually the fact that they are addictive and, you know, addiction is a disease. But in terms of habits, that was my very poor segue. <laughs> I know that that is one of your interests. So, I mean, tell us a little bit more about why you're interested in, in habits. Is it about helping people stop bad habits or helping people form good habits or a little bit of both? Like, what is it that draws you to habit formation or habit breaking? Yeah, great question. So, it was actually somewhat what got me started in this field to begin with, actually. So uh, I had been introduced to behavioral economics initially. That's how I got started with my professor at university smuggling me books on behavioral economics. And I was like, well, this is very interesting. I'm very fascinated about this kind of more nuanced approach to human decision making. But what really got me hooked was seeing a lot of people in my life who were, I guess, struggling with different behavior changes. And then feeling frustrated, I couldn't really help them taking that intention to some good outcome. Oh, so, good guy, Sam. That, that I like. It's so wholesome. <laughs> well, it's, it's nice to be wholesome <laughs> sometime. But uh, yeah, no, it was, it was quite... Uh, like, I'm, I'm sure you guys all can relate to it. Like, we have people in Absolutely our lives that we not. really care about. Absolutely yeah. not. Okay, that's funny. Uh, I, I so, study money, really. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair well it's it's like it's one of those things where it's like one of the hardest things that i can feel like in life is when you when you feel a little bit powerless when you have people going through things and you can't really support them in the wish the way you wish you could and so that was for me the inception of like really trying to understand habit formation because i thought well, well maybe if i can better understand habit formation then i can provide a little bit more support and help these people in my life and so i started with like these more general stuff in terms of the books, but then got really deep into like trying to find all of the different research out there. And, and yeah, that really was got me going into just understanding what makes a behavior happen in a more nuanced way. And I think especially what maybe was for me with behavior economic was I had this like two part journey where I first felt that there was kind of like first part was enlightenment where I'm like, wow, this is so cool. But the second part was like disillusionment where I felt oh. that, hmm okay, this is cool. It's like, I have a tool now, like a hammer. But then when I went around the world, yeah. it was like, okay, some of these things are not nails. They're screws and bolts, whatever, that I can't really use for this thing. And so, especially when it comes to long-term behavior changes, honestly, like a lot yeah. of nudging, for example, doesn't really tackle that stuff. It take, tackles these one-time behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so I was just really curious about how can we support this long-time behavior change? And, and that got me into habits. And so uh, I'll get a little more wholesome now before I'll stop with this uh, stuff. And they say that what really was this kind of amazing thing was that post maybe a couple of years when I have looked into this, I really did some form of like mean intervention with my mom. And she had been wanting to get her meditation habit going for a long time. And she had some stress at work and she wanted to have some way of like center herself in the morning and after work. And um, never got that going. But then we did a little bit of intervention, like just short, like I gave her some tics, tips and tricks. And the next time I spoke to her, she had uh, like a 100-day meditation habit in place. Jesus. And uh, wow. yeah, that was like, you know, I don't know, dopamine burst or like some form of like the, the most reward powerful system. reward system mix in my chemical, in my brain was just like lighting up because it was such a cool thing of, of doing something that I felt at that time, quite trivial. Like I gave her some basic stuff as terms of like what makes a habit stick and like put a strategy for her in place. But it was spending me like 30 minutes with her. Like it wasn't that long time. 
mm-hmm. and then feel like, well, if I can do this with her, like, what if I can help more people on a bigger scale? And so that really set me off into thinking about, okay, how can I scale this? How can I work with this on a bigger scale? And, and the rest is whatever you call it, history of sort. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so that was our uh, wholesome wow. segue. I don't know. I lost the question there. <laughs> I, I, I oh, feel my heart is so full. I feel warm <laughs> and fuzzy. Cute. I haven't felt warm and fuzzy in decades, which is something to tell my therapist, yes. which is lovely. But then let's make this okay. less wholesome, Sam. So how do you apply this yourself? Do you at all apply this to your own life? Because if it's just, you know, rolling this onto other people, it's it's not that impressive. <laughs> Should I practice the way I preach? Yeah, practice what That's you insanity. preach. Crazy. What do you say? No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, I think that's a great question. And uh, it's it's probably also been a very fun thing as a perk of being a behavioral scientist, I think, is being this person who can try a lot of cool things in your own life. You know, you can try to apply what you learn, not only in your work, but also in your own life. And um, I've been, I think, a mix of successes, like having mostly successful. Uh, there's been what I've been able to do is like read 125 books in a year. Like that was one of those things where I initially I wanted to read more books. And so I went from reading, I think four books a year to 25, then 50 and then 125. Then I realized like, it's not really a numbers game. Like you shouldn't read books for the numbers game. And I focus a little more on quality. So now I'm around maybe like 40 or 50 books per year, but definitely knowing a little bit of habits. Still a super high number. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Uh, Podcast listeners won't be able to see my face, but I was just, my eyebrows raised, were raised so high, they were in my hairline. <laughs> That's very impressive. I, I struggle to read one book a year, and I'm supposed to be doing lots of reading. No, but so this, this, this is, yeah, is good. Me. This is good. So, Sam, you can now explain to Sarah how to actually, you know, set up hmm. this habit of reading a fuck ton of books a year. <laughs> so, talk yes. us through it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, the, the first thing, obviously, is you want to make it ridiculously easy to read. And so that's kind of always you want to put, you want to always have that whenever behavioral intervention you do, use folks and making it easy. That's the first thing you try to do, obviously, or you should be obvious. Mm -hmm. Don't worry too much about motivation and so on, but that's important too. Uh, But you used to try to see how you can make it ridiculously easy. Uh, I think for me, from a behavioral perspective, I would always try to connect it to some form of like time and place where you want to read. So I don't know, do you have a certain time and place when you like to read? Probably like right in the middle of the day when I'm supposed to be most productive. That's when I get the urge to to read. <laughs> is there certain like in terms of context, is there a certain time, place, or mm. previous behavior that you could connect that to? It's escapism, Sam. Um, it's escapism from work. Yeah, I would say procrastination. Like if uh but but also I think my, like being serious, like my biggest problem is that I'm always listening to something, watching something or reading something. So when I don't do any of that, I'm just exhausted and don't want to think. So, I mean, that's that's my problem is like, if I'm not looking at a screen, I'll be listening to a podcast. Like I'll in the shower, like when I wake up, like having coffee. I mean, I think that's, so I am reading. I'm just not reading books, you know, like scheduling time to read. So how can I break this bad habit? <laughs> well, so then we're talking a little of bit just about... just constantly putting information into my brain. Sure. Yeah. Well, you're kind of covering a little bit of this idea of like making it easy because like the other side of that coin is your ability to, to do the behavior. And so what you're describing now is that you seem to have very low ability in terms of you might be reading a lot for course later work or school related work. And so I think a common thread is that most people who are, who are at university, I would say especially students aren't super keen on reading because like you say, they spend most of the day maybe reading whatever for their coursework. And that when they then find some time to do something else, it's like, oh, I'm going to read some more. That might not be the best exciting thing. So so then I would just be curious about like, like why do you want to read? Like what is the what is the role reading would fit in your life? Like is it for enjoyment and entertainment or is it to feel smarter or is it to... Uh, show off to other people what you've read like what's the oh we now know what sam's motivation was for reading 125 books per year just so he could mention he read 125 books i'm silent i'm not saying anything oh yeah Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll take your silence we'll read into that but uh (laughs) no i i think my my problem is is that i see really interesting books by really interesting people and i'm like i really want to read that i want to be part of the conversation 
which has led to the number of books I need to read being exponentially long. And there's a huge pile in my room. I mean, if anyone came into my room and saw my bookshelf, they'd be very impressed. But I've you know, only read a very small percentage of them. So yeah, I don't know. It's, I want it in my brain. I just can't get it in my brain. Help so, me. Sam. So from that information, I would say that it's a perfect way to go f- use focus on the habit of reading. So it seems like one of the biggest barriers for you, maybe I'm reading into this a little bit as well, but that you might have high expectation of yourself in terms of reading a lot. And sometimes we focus a little bit too much on the outcome, talking about 125 books, right? And focus less about, okay, how, how can I just get this habit in play? And so mm-hmm. what I would, if I was you, uh, think about is, okay, I want to read. Let's not care too much about how much I read, but let's just care about building some form of reading habit. And so what's important there, like going back to my first question, like the time and place, I wouldn't mm-hmm. say maybe the best time and place is when you're wanting to procrastinate because it's quite hard. I would probably suggest that maybe during breakfast, lunch, or day, like after dinner or something, something like that could be quite useful. And then maybe just having like 15 mm-hmm. minutes or maybe if you, okay, you're not commuting now, obviously, or I think I'm guessing you're not commuting, but that would be another good time, right? Um, what is commute? Who, yeah, on my bike who, with what a is book. Commute? Um, but, <laughs> In the rain, cycling with reading as, as well. It's a, that's a hazard. Yeah, exactly. Hazard. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. That dead time in the commute is like great to like start a new habit, yeah. whether it's listen to a podcast or to read if you can. Yeah. Right. No, I think, or knit. I tried knitting as well. That's great. That was good. Uh, that lasted all of five minutes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to a little bit, so I, I wrap this up before I forget. So... <laughs> What I was going to say is that um, you would then want to pretty much just make that behavior super easy to the point where you know mm-hmm. you can do it every day. You don't want to make it like too easy. I think like sometimes when, okay, I don't want to call people out, but when they say like floss one tooth, I would say maybe you want to Why find- Why only one? Why only Why one? Only one? <laughs> well, the idea is that you should make it like ridiculously so you have no excuses to not to do it. But I think that the risk when you make it like too, too, too easy is that you feel like not accomplished. If you only read a sentence every day, you don't really feel like you're progressing. So I would say like, at least read a something where you feel like, whatever feels easy enough that you can do it every day, but you feel a little bit accomplished. So currently that's mm-hmm. my actually, what I, I've struggled actually this year reading because I think I had a little bit too high bar from last year. This being you year think? Before. Well, yeah, well, that was even before then. So last year, I think I had maybe I read 50, 50 books. This year, I was aiming for something similar, but I've had to lower the bar to around 30 books. Um, yeah, because it's been a little bit insane. But what I've had to do was just, instead of thinking that I'm like, okay, one, let's say, um, I was just going to say that what usually I struggle with if I have that high expectation is that I feel like I'm failing if I don't live up to it, obviously. And so what yeah. you should try to do is to find a way where, okay, you're finding progress. The Duolingo version of this is like doing five minutes a day of using the Duolingo language app, right? And the mm-hmm. same thing you can do with reading a book, like even like five minutes a day, or that's pretty much what I'm doing now. I'm just pretty much focusing on reading four or five pages. That's pretty much what I'm aiming for in the morning. Mm-hmm. When I'm having my coffee in the morning, reading four or five pages, don't really count on the pages, but really like maybe more than one or two and then see how far I go. And then when the time permits, I read a little bit more. But if I don't have time, at least I feel like I'm making a little bit of progress. So I think what was really cool that year when I read 125 books is what was never feeling that hard because I never okay. cramped. Like I never cramped of like reading hours and hours. And I read 40 minutes on the commute back and forth. So 120 hours. Is that? No, wait, 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 no, I'm, I'm tired now. I'm, that was a very bad calculation. 120 minutes. 80 minutes. What the fuck is happening here? Uh, you you <laughs> have to I'm edit this out. You have to edit this out. Otherwise, I will have no nope. repetition nope. left here. Uh, <laughs> bear, please let the record show that this is late in the afternoon and I'm quite tired. But um, <laughs> anyway, so reading 80 minutes, uh, used from that, combining that with reading about 20 minutes before I go to bed. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's 100 minutes, if I'm Mm -hmm. getting my math right here. And then (laughs) I had maybe about 30 to 60 minutes that came from audiobooks, listening to audiobooks at the gym and that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, that's quite a lot of, you know, minutes in a day. 
And definitely that mm. stacks up very quickly. But I never felt like I read that much. You just felt like, okay, read a little bit on the commute, read a little bit before bed, listen a little bit to the book while I'm at the gym. And yeah. So I think that's the goal, right? That's that's okay. that's the aim to not feel like you're having to cram things, but feeling like you have that balance of, you know, doing enough so it feels easy, but you still make progress. And then we can talk a lot about it when it comes to habits. You obviously I want to have reminders in the beginning so you make sure you never forget uh, you want to make sure yeah. that things like talking about context should be super important and removing bad reminders and bad prompts so when i was at the commute i pretty much turned off my phone i only had my kindle there was nothing else that was going to disturb me so that made it much easier and then rewarding is an aspect to building habits it's got to be rewarding so what i just focus on is just like a really, really emphasis on reading good books. As soon as I was reading a book that I didn't really like, I just threw it away. Maybe not literally threw it away, but I started reading it. <laughs> just, and, immediate, just out of the train, yeah. out of the window. Ugh, just garbage. eating that book across the train. Yes, yes. Yeah, I see. That was my approach. Okay. But you know, it's really optimizing for feeling like every time I read, it was feeling fun and enjoyable. And so mm. when you do that, it makes it obviously much more likely that you will be reading on the train. Because then you won't feeling like it's a short, but more of a you know a fun thing that you actually oh I'm looking forward to, you know moving to the next page on this and seeing what's happening in this book or, or better understanding this model that they're explaining whatever it is, and so the, the good news is that I was afraid that like I was going to run out of books and the good news is so many good books there's so many freaking good books <laughs> it yes. does help and, thankfully uh, yes yeah so that was my rant I don't know okay. if that helps. <laughs> No, I think I've I've picked up a lot of insights there. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that free bit of consultancy. Thank you, Sam. That was probably worth quite a lot of money just then <laughs> that I just got for free. I'm going to try and put it into practice. And then when we record the intro and outro, I'll uh, I'll give give the the listener uh, an update as to whether I failed horribly or whether I've started nice. to build a new habit. Good thing. And that will Sarah. be on me. That won't be a reflection on you, Sam. That'll really just be on me. <laughs> I believe in you. Yeah. I believe but in that, you. No, that's great. Aw, Sam, you. you're Thank so you. wholesome. You're like behavioral science's sweetheart. <laughs> oh, that's, that makes yeah, sense. Put, put that put on the LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, put that on the LinkedIn. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Um, well, Sam, we, we've loved having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really have. It's been a great conversation. Um, before we wrap up, something we always like to do, I know you've plugged yourself a little bit but if the listener wants to find out uh what you're doing and stay up, up to date with all of the numerous projects and all the numerous hats that you wear where can they best find you sure so i would say habit weekly is a great place to go so that's my newsletter if you go there you'll inevitably find a way to reach me as well i have a website you can find me on samuelsalsa.com as well but i guess what i wanted to say and this is a risk of being even more wholesome or cringy. But oh. what I'll do is I'll just lastly say that kudos to you guys. I think given that, okay, there are a lot of podcasts out there, but I feel like you're doing great service to the field. And Aww. I've listened to quite a few episodes so far. And sometimes I listen to episodes because I feel like I have to for a new podcast. Because, you know, like, oh, I got to stay on top of the field. But... With you guys, I've actually listened to it because I enjoy it as well. So it's it's been quite a fun, fun thing to see you guys pop up. And I feel like you're doing great things and really wish you guys to keep at it, keep doing the good work. And the field is definitely better thanks to you guys. Oh, Sam, I'm going to cry. So <laughs> awesomeness. I can't deal with this. I'm too Dutch. That was so nice. Oh, my gosh. No. Well, yeah. How, God how, damn it, Sam. How that can was you so even sweet. end on this? Well, guys, this was Sam, you know, behavioral science's sweetheart. I'm going to have to lay down on the couch for a while, maybe drink a very bitter tea to get over all of this sugary goodness. <laughs> damn, Sam. <Sam's laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, again, just lastly, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, yeah, we've loved what you've been putting out into the world. And Absolutely. thanks for spending an hour of your time with us. We really appreciate it. Awesome. My pleasure. All the best. All right, so that was us talking to Sam. I think it was a it was a great talk. 
I genuinely am looking forward to this podcast. <laughs> you know, what one one of many more, um, even with my terrible tradition of not really listening to podcasts. Yes, that's a weird thing to admit on your own podcast. But yeah, <laughs> I, I thought that was a I thought it was a great talk. Sarah, what did you think? Yeah, I think, you know, I've never met Sam before. You know, I don't have the same rapport that, you know, you guys obviously have, long-term collaborators. So, uh, sure. you know, <laughs> it was lovely to meet him. And can I just say what an absolute sweetheart. Yes. <laughs> but no, I think it's been really interesting, you know, to hear, uh, you know, how Sam came into sort of the world of behavioral science and sort of paved his own way before, mm-hmm. you know, there were these sort of lanes that you could sort of follow and sort of dip into to, mm-hmm. to pursue a behavioral science career. I always find that fascinating. And uh, obviously, specifically his insights with habits, you know, I definitely feel as though I got a good deal on that consulting fee uh, Uh (laughs) because it was a lot of a lot of good stuff just in that last five minutes I think of our conversation so you've read 125 books by now uh yes yes I can confirm no you have not you haven't even read 125 books in your life (laughs) no I mean okay so just to sort of break the fourth wall of podcasting a little bit dear listener so we Mm. are recording this outro a couple of days after we actually spoke to Sam I think two days literally two days Mm. yeah so okay I've had a little bit of time to sort of try and implement a new habit or to plant the seeds around sustaining a new habit Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can safely say that it was the, the first day after we had the podcast and while it was all sort of fresh in my mind I sat down with my book after work I really enjoyed it I thought this is great this is actually exactly (laughs) what I wanted to do you know read about 15 pages so you know felt like that's you know a good little little chunk of reading that I could do every day um but but yeah that's sort of that's sort of been it So the excitement of starting a new thing, but none of the follow through. Well, that is not mm-hmm. what makes a habit. So, Sarah, I feel like maybe you should, you know, once we release this episode, it might be a while because we've got quite mm-hmm. a backlog. <laughs> maybe listen yep. to it again, refreshen yes. it in your memory and uh, reattempt the habit. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know what I think has really like done me over is mm. the fact that I did feel so good after I did it for the first time that I told loads of people that I'd done it Aww. you know <laughs> I, I I bragged about having read for 15 minutes and you know this is going to be the start of a really good habit and it's it's you know that thing that happens when you tell someone your intention to exercise and you get that sort of rush of like mm. yeah I feel good about myself I'm gonna do this and people know that I'm gonna do this that actually sometimes you don't end up doing it mm-hmm. right because you've already had <laughs> Which, the rush yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I've I've scuppered myself there, really. So I, I really I should just never tell anyone about anything ever again, and I'll be super productive. Yeah, you can just tell people at the end. Oh yeah, I totally read two hundred and fifty books this year. <laughs> Show yeah, me what you got, yeah. Sam. Show me what you've got. <laughs> no, but like I mean, not focusing on the numbers too much. But like, I'm an avid reader. I love to read. But like, I still think one hundred twenty-five books. I'm not sure I would manage. Like, I can mm. see where I would find the pockets of time, and I still don't yes. think I would be able to do it. Because I feel like halfway through, I, because I'm a numbers person, so mm, I would true. genuinely focus on being like, oh, this is my 38th book, and I've only read 55 pages a day. It would take all the joy out of reading for me. But I'm sure I can do this with a different type of habit. But yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's good to know. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe for me, I need to make reading more of a competitive sport. Maybe that's the only way. Yeah, that <laughs> I'm would gonna work. I'm going to be motivated for you. to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. See, In- individual differences. Yes. You know, similar brains, but but different reactions to external mm-hmm. stimuli. I think that's you know just the human experience right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do think talking about experience that how Sam experienced, you know, getting into the field and becoming, I would like to say, quite successful in the field is is very different from ours. And like, I know I called Sam uh, an OG, but like, 
to be quite <laughs> frank, Sam's not that old. As in, like, no. Sam is not, like, you know... When we're talking of oh, OGs, God. we obviously, we tend to think of, like, Thaler and Kahneman. Like, th- these are old men. I mean, that's not a dig at men. They, they just all happen to be male. But, like, Sam is not that old. And I feel like his name, especially as a behavioral practitioner or, in his mm-hmm. own terminology, a behavioral strategist or, before that, a oh, yeah. behavioral designer... You know, I feel like he's made quite a name of himself, especially through, you know, the the communicative um, hats that he has, such as, you know, having Habit Weekly and then having co-authored the book. Like, I I think it's it's really quite interesting because Sam isn't that old. And Sam is, you know, despite being an OG, relatively young for being an OG. And so I I just find it interesting. I I, I like seeing relatively young people succeed in the field because obviously that's you know, good for me and for you as well, because we're also relatively young. So it means it can be done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the the key there is relative. So yeah. I, I'm I'm interested. At what point do you become old, old in, in, your, <laughs> in your mind? Like, no, but not even in your mind, but like according to other people, when are you old? When is it like, when, when do your achievements stop being like, mm-hmm. oh, that's really impressive for their age? And when does it just have to be like, oh, that's really impressive? Yeah, it's mm. it's an interesting one. I think it's always going to be a little bit relative, you yeah. know, from from where you're standing. If someone's older than you or younger than you, like that's your that's your reference point is is yourself. That's that's kind of natural, I think. But no, I I, I think you're right. I think it's you know maybe it's just a reflection of you know where we are in our in the stage of our lives and the fact that the next big thing on the horizon for us is sort of trying to pave. A career or get started in a job like please anyone hire us like <laughs> that's sort of how we feel we'll right literally now. be available from september <laughs> next year onwards just let me you know yeah. <laughs> yeah so and you know i think potentially rooted in that you know is this interest in understanding how other people have done it before us mm-hmm. um so yeah. yeah so sam was a great person to talk to uh about this like yeah for sure although he's pretty much indicated that you know we have it a lot easier given that our degrees literally say behavioral science on them which i mean fair play yeah i mean i think there are a lot of factors to consider but i think yeah on on that front you know there are degrees that exist now that didn't exist 10 years ago that you know maybe someone would have wanted to take if it had existed um sure but yeah, there we go. We stand on the shoulders of giants, as yes, always. As always. <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll let you know in a year's time, Sam, whether you know we we actually managed to to get the jobs <laughs> in behavioral science and whether the trajectory was as uh, was as easy as we would have liked it to be. I mean, the, the current job market situation is in complete shambles. Um, <laughs> but you know, on that super positive note, guys, I hope this was a thought-provoking, entertaining, educational, or at least somewhat interesting episode. Uh, thanks again to Sam for making the time. Sam, always lovely to talk to you. And guys, we hope to see you in the next one, which will, you know, upload next Monday, as it always does. Have a good week. You're the dummy that don't believe in science All your projects always be denying You're the one alone